we're blessed. We love you. We ask your forgiveness, Lord, and your blessing. In your name, amen. Happy Sabbath, friends. We are here for part two in the series of Faith Plus, Faith and. And today we're going to be talking about faith and works. And I'm sure at some point in all of your Christian experience that this conversation has come up maybe in your own personal dialogue in between you and the Lord or with someone else. And uh, we talk about what is faith, what is works, and how do you harmonize these two thoughts. So that's what we're going to take a stab at this morning in, in our discussion, in, in our, our Bible study this morning. But before we begin, begin I'd like to highlight uh, just a couple of notes from Pastor Adrian's message last week. And um, to kick that off, I want to read from a little book that I have. It's called uh, Living by Faith. And if you didn't catch last week's sermon, it's all encapsulated in one little paragraph here. And this little book here is written by some guys by the name of uh, Jones and Wagner, and uh, on the topic of faith. It says this, faith, faith is composed of two elements, belief and the Word of God. And that's exactly what Pastor Adrian was speaking about last night that God's Word says it, and we are then to believe what it says and to act upon what it says, and that's faith. Often we may be moved upon emotions or feelings or on our own thoughts, but first and foremost, yes, we must believe, but it must be based upon the Word of God. Counterfeit faith has only one of these elements. It always lacks the Word. It rests on something else, some feeling or impression or hope or desire, or process of reasoning, or on the word of some person. Faith, on the other hand, accepts the word of God, no matter how it reads, without questioning. Pretended faith is often obliged to explain the word away, but genuine faith worketh by love. Pretended faith either doesn't work at all, or works by some motive which has its roots in self. And in that thought, I, I think about the story of when God asked Saul to go in and to destroy the Amalekites, to leave none of them alive, and to destroy man, beast, women, child, everything. God had a purpose and a reason for that. But Saul, he chose to hold back the, the goodly cattle, the animals, for the purpose of sacrifice. Now, he had, in his reason, he used a religious excuse, and he says, no, we'll keep these, we'll sacrifice these animals as an excuse. We'll, we'll give these to God when God didn't ask for them. The Word of God didn't uh, sanction that action. And so they used uh, their, their faith as an excuse for their action. And in turn, it wasn't so that they were being extra generous to God. It was actually so that they wouldn't have to sacrifice their own animals that God was asking them to give, but they were giving out of their excess, right? So we can use excuses, and we can use our reasons to reason away even the Word of God. But first and foremost, our faith must have these two components. Belief, belief in God, founded, and uh, the motive and the action must come from the Word of God. Now, I'm going to invite... Uh, Emily to come up here. She was going to help with this little demonstration. She remembers last week, Pastor Adrian, he gave an illustration. He says that if I had a blank or a check here for a million dollars, you guys remember that illustration? He all had you on hopes that he was about to give away a million dollars. Well, I want to be the favored pastor here, so I'm going to try and do something a little bit better, okay? Is that he says that, uh, uh, I need to ask the question, Emily, do you trust me? Yes, so she trusts me. Um, I asked her beforehand just to make sure she wasn't going to let me down on this. So you trust me. Now, do you think that I'm good for my word? So if I promise to you that I'm going to give you all of the cash that is in my pocket right now, uh, do you think I'm going to come good on that promise? Yes, yeah. yeah, so she thinks so. 
That's good. So she believes. Now, before I give it to you, do you think that I'm worth a lot and I'm going to be able to give you a lot of money? Now, be honest. Um, I think so. Oh, you... Th- Ooh. <laughs> All right. I'll, uh, I guess we've got to break her heart here, but I'm going to give you a, a roll of cash. So go ahead. That's yours. Now, once you've received that money, have a close look at it. Do you feel really, really rich right now? Go ahead and have a good look at it. You can take it apart if you like. Do you feel really... Ooh, she's, she's trembling here. She's excited. Now, do you feel like you received some money that's worth something here? No, no she doesn't feel... Uh, no. Because what did you expect, really? I'm not worth a lot of money, am I? Actually, here, I'll give you all the cash that's in my pocket right now, and it's only $5, so that's for keeps. You can keep that one, because that's what you expect. So what, you, you can actually keep those as well. I won't, I won't uh, take it all away. Go ahead, you can sit down. Is that faith, we believe in God's Word, and we believe that His resources are enough to back up what He is saying, right? Now, Emily, she thought I was actually really rich, and I had to break it to her. I'm not. But God is so wealth that so wealthy that his riches are abundance and grace. And yet sometimes we translate our experience with humanity, where humanity has let us down, where we think that, oh, because humanity has disappointed me, or I've counted on the hopes or the promises of someone else and they've let me down, that maybe God's promises are kind of the same way. It's a little bit hit and miss. It's about kind of, uh, we're not sure if he can come true on that. To illustrate this, I want to tell you a little bit of uh, a story. I used to play in an orchestra back in Canada. I used to play violin. Now, emphasis on used to, okay? And we would sit in this orchestra where there was about 50 players, and we would sit on some chairs, these little stools that we would fold up and we would move from concert hall to concert hall. We'd set up our stage and we'd sit on these chairs. Now, these chairs got a lot of use. And every concert experience or every time, we would exercise faith, believing that that stool was going to hold us up, didn't we? And from time to time, people's faiths were just shattered. You thought I was going to fall there, didn't you? People's faiths were shattered because they had put all their hope, all their weight rested upon that little stool, and that stool just went, it just cracked, whoa, and they fell over backwards, right? Their faith was shattered. Now, sadly, we translate that experience into our faith with God, that we are scared to put all of our weight on the promises of God. Is it really true that if we confess our sins, He's faithful to just to cleanse us of all, of all unrighteousness? Is that really true? And sometimes we like to come with the mentality that I'm going to first present the best that I have to God and say, God, surely you must be able to look upon me with favor because of my good works. Now, I'll put a little weight on your promises, but I'm going to put a little weight on my works as a way of saying, God, I'm good enough. You can save me. Now, I don't know if you've been in that place before in your reasoning and in your prayers with God. And maybe your past experiences where your faith has been shattered (laughs) through chairs or through people, and you're fearful to, is it really, can we really take God at his word? Yes, we can. And I want to look at the, at the experience that we see here in the book of Romans now, in Romans chapter 4, where one of the, the, the great members of the hall of faith is Abraham. It says here in Romans chapter 4, and in verse 4 and 5, God's word tells us something special here. It says, Now to him who works... This is Romans 4, 4. Now to him who works, the wages are counted as grace, not counted as grace, but as debt. 
If we, if we try to approach God trying to present all of our good deeds, now when I define works, those are, are maybe our good behaviors or good deeds or acts of kindness and grace towards other people. And we like to take these pathetic offerings to God and say, God, see, you actually owe me now for the good things that I do. This is what it's like coming to the omnipotent God that has no need of anything except your heart. He needs your heart. And we're trying to prove and to earn his love through our works, and we're saying, actually, you owe me. But that's not how it works. Because it says in verse 5, But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Notice what this passage says. That God is the justifier of the ungodly. That he's not the justifier of the perfect, because they don't need it. He's not the justifier of the sinless, because they're not there. But he is the justifier. He is the one that is able to forgive, to cleanse. His role in your life that he's wanting to ex exercise, and he is good for it. His checks are not, like mine, a wad of fake cash. He will pay it in full, and he wants to, that his role is to justify, to make perfect, to make cleansed the ungodly. And that's each one of you here in this room. Sometimes we balance between these two extremes. And maybe we've heard this message before, and we think in awe, wow, wow. God's done it all. I don't have to earn my salvation. Whew. And we fall into the other pitfall. Well, if God has done everything, I don't need to do anything. Therefore, well, he's just going to clean me anyways. For example, I was working at a, at a school, and I was, I was a dean in this, in this uh, boarding academy. And uh, one of our boys came into our dormitory, and, and the, the, he had come in with his muddy boots. And we treated our dorms like our home. That's where they lived when they were out of school. And he came in with his muddy boots, and he stomped up the stairs. And one of the deans, they stopped him. He said, hey, what are you doing? Take your boots off before you come inside, as you would do at home. And he looks at the muddy tracks that, he has just looked, that, that, that followed him to where he stood, and he says, well, that's what the janitors are for, aren't they? Guess what he was doing for the next few months, right? He was moved to janitor duty. <laughs> Is that just because God cleanses us, it doesn't say that, well, we just carry on sinning. Where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. No, we've missed the picture. So we have the two extremes that, well, God has done everything I need to do, nothing, and that's not even talking about the conversation that my, my works bring merit to salvation. That's not what I'm talking about. But then we have the other extreme that I need to earn my salvation. I need to present my good works before God. And they try to do everything. And both are tiresome. Both are tiring. Now to harmonize these two passages, I want you to go with me to the book of James chapter 2. We have to go there for talking about faith and works, don't we? And in James chapter 2, and it says here in verse 14, What does a prophet, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? So this is the opposite extreme, the one that is not working, but the one that believes that God has done everything, so they're just going to carry on sinning because God is going to continue to forgive them, and they have no, no worth or value or understanding of the grace that God is giving to them, and it's almost, they just throw it back in God's face, assuming His grace is just going to keep, as it does, but it's thankless, and there's no gratitude in it. He carries on in his argument. It says, If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warm, be filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? James here is saying that if you have faith, it, there is going to be a call to action of physical demonstration of those things in your life. 
like showing acts of mercy and grace. Because you have received that act of mercy and grace into your life that because you, out of gratefulness that you're going to want to demonstrate and to give those acts of mercy to those around us, whether it's those that need food or they need clothes, that you're going to demonstrate that grace to them as well. Verse 17, Thus also faith by itself, it does not have works, it's dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. James is not entering into the argument here that his works are purchasing God's favor. But his works are out of response because he understands that he already has God's favor. If we can understand that we don't have to try and earn God's love, but he loves us anyways, it changes our attitude. See, works is not actually the problem here. It's our attitude in which we approach them. That I'm the problem, and you're the problem. That if we try to think that this is going to bring favor to my name, but no. We do this because we love Jesus. Just like this morning, I woke up, I had a mustache, because it was November, right? November. I was actually really starting to become comfortable with this mustache. I've never grown one before. I liked it. It was growing on me. (laughs) But my wife says to me, if you love me, you will shave that off of your face. So I hear I stand before you right now with no mustache. It was beautiful. I took a picture. Because I love my wife, it's gone. Not because I want to earn her love, because I already have her love. And no mustache. I want to call up my two volunteers. I have Chris here, and I got uh, Benjamin. Yeah, can you guys come up here? I'm wanting them to be involved in preaching this morning. You don't have to say a thing, it's okay. Now, in a demonstration of our works and... Uh, and those that have faith that that works, right? We have our illustration here of our chair. Have you guys seen this chair before? Benjamin, you're going to be the one that's going to sit on it. But do you believe that this chair is going to hold you up? Yeah? yeah? You've never seen it, though, but you think it's still going to hold you up. Looks well, you, you saw that it held me up, didn't you? <laughs> it looks sturdy enough. So you're willing to put all your weight down on this chair, believing that it's going to hold you up. All right, let's see it. Go ahead and sit down. Now, what does it feel? Does it feel good? Yes. Feel comfortable? Okay, good. Now, on the other hand, we might have Chris here that wants to earn his salvation, right? That he wants to still talk the talk and he wants to walk the walk. He wants to look the part. So I'm going to actually have him try and look like he's uh, a Christian here, like our faithful Benjamin. You're going to have a seat here, Chris, but you've got no chair. It's your works that are holding you up. So I want to just, just go ahead, and, and you can, do, can you do that air sit, or do we need to put you against the wall over here? You want to do the wall? Okay. Um, yeah. Can you do it right here without bonking your head on the screen? Go ahead. Lean against the wall and do a wall sit. Now, I want to see a nice 90-degree bend in your legs there. Okay. Now, does that feel comfortable? No. Are you at rest? No. He's not at rest. But you want to notice between the two, they have a similar position, don't they? They may be able to have a similar conversation, that their, their works may be exhibited in a similar way. Do you feel pretty good still? Yeah. You're resting in that chair, aren't you? Now, Chris, over here, we don't leave you too long. Do you feel at peace over here? Not that old. <laughs> oh, why is that? Ah. <laughs> All right, come on up here. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Health and safety officer, are you okay? Yes. Thank you, Chris. Oh, see, works is painful, isn't it? It doesn't pay. <laughs> but Chris, you could do that all day, couldn't you? Or, or um, Benjamin, you could do that all day. Yeah. Yeah. Both were walking the walk, having a similar conversation. 
But those that try to earn their salvation through their works, it's soul crushing. It hurts your head. <laughs> All right, you can go and sit back down. Thanks, guys. Sometimes we do works for reputation's sake, where we try to keep up the status quo to make sure that everybody perceives that I'm, I'm a good Christian. And even in those works, I'm not serving God, but I'm serving you, aren't I, or apparently. I know to illustrate this, I think back at a, at a, it was a dark time in my life and my wife's, and it was when my first son was born. Now, it was filled with great joy because he was born, but there's something that comes sometimes with some mothers. There's a bit of depression and um, extra stresses because you've got this screaming little ball in your life, right? And it was very difficult on my wife. Now, the next Sabbath, we were at church. My wife was not fit for it. She should have been resting for the next two months, three months, as she is right now resting at home with our third child. I've learned a little bit is that I thought, wow, we, want, we don't want anything to rock our faith, and I want to demonstrate to the world that I'm being faithful. We're going to keep going to church, right? Even when my wife is dying beside me, and she went along with me, and it was hard for her. It was difficult for her, right? I wasn't serving God by trying to make sure that our family looked like it was happening, looked like it was all together, I was serving myself. And that's where works come from. There's no, um, at the bottom of it, when you peel away all the facades and all, of the, all the dirty bits and pieces, it's not an attitude of gratitude of serving God. It's, it was serving my, my selfish and carnal nature, trying to keep up appearances. So sometimes for appearance sake, we may use works to demonstrate if I can't fake God, I'll fake everybody else around me that I have it together, right? Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 7. Chris, I'm feeling really bad about your head. Is it okay? Okay, thanks. Sorry. Luke chapter 7. I want to read a story here in closing. Luke 7, I'm starting in verse 36. It says, Then one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house, and he sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table for the Pharisee's house, brought in an alabaster flask a fragrant oil, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and to wipe them with her hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. And when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, they spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of a woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner." And Jesus answered and said to Simon, I have something to say to you. He says, teacher, go on and say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing, and when they had nothing with them to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? And Simon answered and said to him, I suppose the one whom he forgave more, and he says, you're right, you've rightly judged. Do you see this woman, Simon? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil, Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven you. Go in peace. It's 
such a vivid and powerful story that we see Jesus here interacting with two sinners. Two sinners. And when you put all the way all the facades, at the core of each of those individuals, Simon and the harlot here, they're the same. Same. And yet this woman throws herself at the feet of Jesus. One, because she recognizes the weight of her sin. But she knows how powerful her Savior is. And she believes that Jesus can come good on that offer and cleanse her of her sin. Simon, on the other hand, he's just as dirty, just as filthy. And if you study, it actually turns out that Simon actually led this woman into sin, into her experience. Yet he doesn't see it. He doesn't recognize that need. Jesus wasn't making a comparison here. Well, this woman's really bad because she recognizes her sin and therefore she loves much. It's that he was pointing to Simon saying, your sin is just as bad, but I can save that too. God's promises, they're all good. We can take them all to the bank and cash them in. Jesus is a faithful Savior. We don't need to try and earn through our works His favor, but He's already demonstrated how much He loves us in dying on that cross for us. Go with me to the book of John, chapter 12. We're going to read a text here in a moment. But nine years ago, I was flying from Seattle to Baltimore, Maryland. And I was sitting at the very back of the airplane by the toilet. And actually, it's a nice place to sit because you can stand up and have a little walk around. And you get to have a look at all the people as they come in and going. And as I was sitting at the back of the plane, I was in the aisle seat. And I see a businesswoman at the very front of the plane get up out of her seat and she was dressed in business attire, business suit, business skirt and, and high heels and she was walking very boldly and confidently. She was on a mission. She was coming back to the toilet. <laughs> right? Now, giving her all of those, uh, um, uh, assuming the best of her, um, She's probably not in a mood for pleasantries at this moment or smiles. But she just bowls past me and goes to the, to the loo. As she comes out of the loo, I'm standing there and uh, sitting there, sorry, in my seat. And she walks past me in a hurried way again with that, that confidence, with that boldness that she probably has. She walks around her office place commanding people's attention probably some CEO of some company, I don't know. But she walks past me in that same and confident way. And out of the corner of my eye, I see something long and white fluttering <laughs> attached to her shoe. Okay? This long piece of toilet paper is stuck to her high heel. A little part of me was like, wow. Oh, Let's just see how this works. <laughs> right? Just let her go. But I don't know why or what I did there, but as I was sitting in my seat, it was just as a response. I see this little piece of tissue. I immediately step out into the aisle and I stomp on it. And I catch it from her shoe and she carries on. I pick it up and I wad it up and I throw it away. And to this day, she knows not of, I don't know, would that have been humiliating for her? Maybe yes, maybe not, I don't know. But to this day, she does not know the grace that was exercised towards her. The mercy that was given to her when maybe she didn't even deserve it. See, 
See, friends, when God's grace enlightens our life, it can motivate us to be gracious towards others, even people when they don't deserve it. And we're not even entering the conversation of, well, I'm doing this to earn God's favor, but it's because we're already basking in it. That we're able to move confidently, sitting and resting in His grace, resting in His love, doing the works of God because we love Him. In John chapter 12, I want to close with this text. In John chapter 12 and verse 35, Then Jesus said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become the sons of light. What action word do you see in this passage? Walk. Walk. Walk in the light. Friends, works, they don't bring merit to our salvation in no way. But genuine faith always is a call to action. To walk. To walk in the light. To keep up with it. To move with Jesus. Now, friend, maybe this morning you may have some burden on your heart. Maybe you've been reading in God's Word. And God has impressed something on your heart from His Word, not from other people, but this is that connection between you and God, and He's calling you to walk in the light. Not to earn it, but to respond to that love that He's giving you. And today you're needing to take that next step. You know, I have conversations with people that say, well, I, I can't keep the Sabbath. I see that it is the true Sabbath of God, the Saturday. But if I do that, I'll lose my job. Right? If I try to, uh, they'll fire me for sure. And so they're basing their faith and their experience by how they feel. Friends, God's promises are sure. If He says it, God who calls us is faithful. He will also do it. He will see us through. So if there's something that's on your heart this morning that God is asking you to take that next step in faith, to walk in the light as He is in the light, I urge you to press on because we have a trustworthy Savior. Amen? And He, He will hold you up. It's a lot harder to tre keep trying to earn it, but He will hold you up. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're grateful for Your abundant mercy and grace towards us, that it's fresh, it's new every day, it never gets old, and sometimes we get distracted and disorientated, but Lord, today we want to refocus our attention on you and go forward with boldness and works of grace and mercy because you love us. Lord, I pray for that one that you're calling today, Lord, to step out in faith. You know their experience and you know what they're calling them to. Lord, I pray that you'll be near them. Help them to take that step of faith in their life today to hold tightly to your hand and go forward with confidence because your promises are sure. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In closing, we're going to sing a song. My faith has found a resting place. <laughs>